You're listening to the Business and Life Podcast, where seven days a week, proven entrepreneurs share their success stories, failures, and give you true value on how you can build a great business and an awesome life with your host, Mike Olivas. Business and Life. Today, we're chatting with Jordan Goodman, who is known as America's Money Answers Man because he has been answering America's money questions about personal finance for over 40 years. His website is moneyanswers.com and he is the host of the weekly Money Answers radio show on the Voice of America Business Network. He was the Wall Street correspondent at Money Magazine for 18 years and had written 13 books on financial topics including the Barron's Dictionary of Finance and Investment Terms, Master Your Debt, Everyone's Money Book, and Fast Profits in Hard Times. He is a frequent guest on national and local TV and radio shows across the country speaking on personal finance issues. Jordan, welcome to the show. Great to be with you, Mike. Absolutely. Thanks for the time. So tell our listeners something interesting about yourself and also maybe where you're calling in from today. I'm calling in from Elmsford, New York, which is in Westchester, just north of New York City. And uh, as my story, well, I've been a kind of combination entrepreneur journalist for over 40 years. I could take you back to the very beginning, Mike, if you want to see my first entrepreneurial venture. What was your first entrepreneurial venture? At age 12. Okay. I used to, at age 12, my, my parents had a place in Hyannis, in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And I used to write for the local newspaper, the Cape Cod Times. I did a column, this is at age 12, about youth baseball. I used to talk about the, the Dennis and the Yarmouth and the Falmouth leagues and all those kind of things. So I'd be hanging around the newsroom, and it, uh, then I'd started delivering the paper at the same time I was writing for it. And then the, the ferries go over to Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket. That was right near where my house was. So I noticed in the printing area that there was tons of papers left over every day, tons. So I went up to the printer. I said, what do you do with these? Did we just throw them away? I said, would you mind if I take them? He said, good. It's much less work for us. So I'd take the papers, my cost of funds, my cost of goods was zero. I would bike them down to the uh, ferries and sell them as people were going on the ferries. And I'd go, you know, over the ferries. By the end of the time, the ship would sail like whatever, 75% of the people had, had uh, bought papers because they're sitting around doing nothing. And everybody else has got papers and, you know, so on. And then oh, I'd wow. just do the next boat. <laughs> so I used to make... $150 a day, you know, 25, 50 cents at a time, selling the papers that I wrote for. <laughs> wow. That was my first yeah, that's awesome. Entrepreneurial slash journalistic venture. Yeah. Talk I about an opportunity. My cost of goods was zero. Yeah. And I just had, a, and my, at the end of the day, my hands were filled with black ink. But it was oh, yeah. Deal. I bet. I bet. Well, yeah. <laughs> talk about the great timing of it. Like, you're going to toss these anyways. Let me go on, Let me go sell them. Exactly. I love it. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about uh, what Jordan Goodman does uh, for uh, in terms of moneyanswers.com. We can talk a little bit about that. What does it bring to the marketplace, Jordan? So uh, I became a journalist and uh, went to Columbia School of Journalism and quickly got into financial journalism, particularly personal finance journalism. Uh, and I started Money Magazine in 1979 and was there for 18 years and learned everything about the whole world of personal finance. And then I've always been kind of a slash journalist entrepreneur, trying to help people while being a journalist at the same time. So I've done 13 books on different aspects of personal finance. Um, probably my best selling ever one is called The Dictionary of Finance and Investment Terms. It sold about three and a half million copies worldwide wow. in 10 editions, just defining all the terms of finance and investment. I did one called, um, uh, Fast Profits and Hard Times, How to Profit Even When the Economy is Bad. I did one called Master Your Money Type, about people's financial personalities. Uh, Master Your Debt, about how people with debt. I did one about student loans called The Ultimate Guide to Student Loans. I won't go through all 13, Mike, but there's been a lot of them. Yeah. So these well, are all things to try to help you. Jordan, out of all of those, whether it's highest seller or not, what was the favorite one that you wrote? I would say the dictionary. Okay. It's kind of, a very difficult thing to do. But once it's done, it's like an annuity and it helps. I mean, every uh, MBA class, every library around the world, um, 
tons and tons of individuals uh, broker training class. I mean, it's been used, it, the first edition was 1984. So it's had a major, major impact. Before that, there had not been a dictionary in the financial world since the, since the early 40s. You know? So it really played, and again, it's something I saw a need in the marketplace. Yeah. Uh, the publisher had a whole line of other dictionaries. They came to me while I was at Money Magazine. Hell of a lot of work, <laughs> but yeah, you know, as far as impact, I think there can't anything be. It's been translated into Korean, and Russian, and Chinese, and German, and everything else all over the world. So I think as far as impact, kind of hard to beat that one. Very cool. Well, that's great. Congratulations on all your successes on 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 that book, and obviously the other books that you've had. Jordan, tell me tell me a time where you felt that during your entrepreneur journey that you felt that you had to overcome a really big hurdle before you hit uh, either financial disaster or rock bottom in your terms? Sure, sure. Everybody's got those stories, and I've got, got some for sure. Yes, Basically, sir. it comes down to trusting people who shouldn't have been trusted, is what it sure. comes down to. So in the mid-1990s, I was still at Money Magazine, and I used to do, you know, I do radio shows, TV shows all the time. I used to do a weekly radio show with a guy named Sonny Block, B-L-O-C-H who himself had a uh, daily radio broadcast on 300 stations around the country for National Stowe. So I was one of his regulars. And Sonny and I got to know each other very well. He had previously done, in theory, seven books. He had not written a word of them, but he had other authors who he did it with. He put his name on it, they wrote it, and they sold tons and tons of, of copies. So he said to me, why don't, you, why don't we do a book together? Meaning I do all the work and he gets the credit, but you know, um, <laughs> and about personal finance. And so we did, I wrote a book called Everyone's Money Book, which was 910 pages, came out in 1992, wow. sold a ton of copies. The publisher was really, it was very comprehensive about all aspects of personal finance, basically. But it's all right, that was the deal. I wrote it, we put our pictures on it together. And it got out there and it was doing really, really well. And then out of the blue, the feds go after Sonny for all kinds of bad things. I mean, he was highly successful. He did not need to do any of these things. But for example, he wanted to buy some radio stations. So he said, uh, on the air, invest in my radio stations. And the SEC went after him for unregistered uh, selling of securities without a license. But Anyway, so he fled to the Dominican Republic, he oh, divorced his wife of 25 years, married a Dominican printing baroness. Uh, her, her father owned printing plants all around uh, Central and South America. Uh, and, you know, they had this huge mansion on the top of this huge hill with this big pool overlooking the harbor and the whole thing. So he went there and he was broadcasting a show from the, the mansion in Dominican Republic saying, you can't get me, I'm here, can't get me. Well, he didn't think there was a, an extradition treaty with Dominican Republic. It turns out there was an extradition treaty with the Dominican Republic, and they went and got him. <laughs> so, oh, wow. So he ended up in jail, literally, in, the, in the, the tombs, as they call it, in New York City. And it was a big scandal. New York Post, you know, Sonny arrested in his you know, bathing suit in Dominican Republic, the whole crazy thing. And so here I am out there with my name on a book, a very prominent book with Sonny. It's like he'd been oh, fine right. for 10 years and then he blew up. It was stuck to Sonny Magazine and it's like, um, this is not good. <laughs> so, um, what did you, what so was it was a process it was, there, you think, Jordan? How would you, how would you replay that? I mean, is that something, do you feel that's something that you couldn't control or now looking back at it, did you learn like, Maybe I should look more into partners because um, I'm, well, I'm right. thinking not out loud here for the listeners and also for that's anybody right. that, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? But I mean, again, this is somebody I dealt with for 10 years every week. Yeah, exactly. You don't know. And something. he had a huge radio following, huge. I mean, he had Alan Greenspan. He had every top economist on that show. You wow. Know? Wow. And I was one of them. <laughs> so, but then things started getting a little bit itchy. He, you know, he got greedy is what it was about. Yeah. And he did some other things that were a little bit kind of shady. And at that point, as a matter of fact, I remember we were going to shoot the cover picture for the book. And I started hearing about some of these things. I said, Sonny, you've got it all. You don't need this. Don't be greedy. Don't go over the edge. 
you don't need this. He's got this big brownstone in New York. He has a wife, two kids. The whole thing was like great. You got this radio network. Just, just leave it alone. And he just couldn't. He just had that. I'm so big, nobody will ever touch me. Kind of attitude. Right. And I mean, at that point, it was really the book was about to come out. I mean, it was kind of far down the road to pull out, you know. Um, but when you suspect things going wrong, cut bait, I guess is the way to put it. Because, I mean, not that I could have stopped it. The book was about to come out. But your reputation is everything. And uh, Yeah, yeah so especially in that world, you're right. I kind of got caught. You know, it was embarrassing. <laughs> this is a funny story. Sure. So the first thing I wanted to do was to get his picture and name off the book, right? Yeah. So, how, I, you know, we had a contract with both of our names. So how do you get permission? I had to write him a letter in the tombs <laughs> and hope that this prison guard would give it to him because they open all the mail, you know? Yeah. And I gave him a form saying, you know, I hereby allow Jordan to take my name and picture off the book. And, you know, like, like he, he rented a pencil or something and kind of scrawled it. And I get back this kind of scrawly thing from you know, the prisoner number, this and this and this giving permission to do it. And then we immediately came out with a book with me only on it, you know? Okay. Yeah. So you kind of came up to it. We had a situation where it's reputational, but of course in, in the book, in the publishing world, your name is your bond there, right? Like you are the brand. You're right. So I get, I get it, Jordan. So. And I've done the book hundred percent anyway. You know? sure. Oh yeah, exactly. It's still your book. Yeah. You just kind of. So anyway, it went on. It's with me only on it and all that, but things happen. You can't always predict what's going to happen. Do the best you can. And, I guess when things get a little squirrely, you've got to kind of get, have your, your heightened sense of danger come up, I guess might be one way to put it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, you made it out, light at the end of the tunnel, took some time, obviously, but didn't tarnish the name fully. You're obviously right. here 13 books later. I want to ask a question, and I always try to kind of jump into people's specific realm, but also not just the finance world, but the book writing world. What are those entrepreneurs out there? What kind of advice would you give an entrepreneur that feels like he's quite, you know, an expert at what he's doing to, um, that's probably aspiring to write a book. What kind of advice would you give to a potential or aspiring book writer? The purpose of writing a book for the vast majority of people is not to make money. It's to burnish your reputation and credibility. Yeah. Um, just the book world has shrunk so dramatically today. I mean, the vast majority of people buy their books on Amazon and don't go to bookstores. Yeah. So getting your book into a bookstore <clears throat> is no big deal today because there's hardly any bookstores to get it into. You know, Borders went out of existence, Barnes and Noble's on the ropes. Um, and frankly, I would not go to an existing publisher. <clears throat> the la latest book I did, which is called The Ultimate Guide to Student Loans, there's a self-publishing division of Amazon called Kindle Direct Publishing. And you can have your book printed and distributed in about an hour. <laughs> Literally, you give them the, uh, the text, they will design the cover, it goes out as an ebook. they print it on demand. You don't have to fill up your warehouse or your garage with unsold books. They have an order coming in over Amazon, they print it and ship it and hit the credit cards, done. Yep. So if you sell some books, great, but the main thing is to be able to show a book as I'm an expert in this field. Um, so if you have your heads on right, not think you're going to go in as an author and sell gazillions of copies and make lots of money, that's the reason you should do a book today. Are you struggling to grow your business? Have you ever thought, man, I wish I could answer my specific questions about my business? Well, you're in luck and I can help. Go to michaellevis.com and sign up to schedule a free live on-air call today. That's right. For a limited time, we're recording real business owners with real struggles. Right. I agree. It's more for credibility. I mean, if um, I think uh, another author that I've had on, on the show, several of them, but similar, definitely similar advice. And it's great to hear that Jordan similarities because it's the truth is that don't, don't write a book to make money, but definitely write a book to try to make a difference and put the time and effort into it to actually send a legitimate message that's going to be great content, great takeaways. Right? And have a, and a brand name. Have a brand name built around. Right. And my brand name is Money Answers. I'm the America's Money Answers man. My website is moneyanswers.com. I've got the Money Answers newsletter, the Money Answers YouTube channel, on and on it goes. You know, you build a brand name around the title of that book, whatever it may be. Okay. So uh, yeah. 
that that's really it should be the cornerstone of a kind of a ecosystem, I guess you might say. Absolutely, yeah, that's exactly right. What are you excited about within uh, your business right now? Well, there's lots of resources that really make a huge difference in people's lives financially that they don't know about. And I love to tell people about things Please, make a huge difference in their lives, either as individuals or as small business people. So I'd just like to share some of the ideas I have. At MoneyAnswers.com, I've got what's called the Resource Center, which has told many, 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 maybe over 100 resources that help people in all aspects of personal finance and mortgages and real estate and travel and banking and uh, you, you taxes, you name it. So I just want to highlight a few things that maybe would help some of your audience members in, in various ways. So one of the first ones is called the strategy of mortgage equity optimization. And what that does is that allows you as an individual to pay your 30-year mortgage off in about five to seven years on your existing level of income. You don't need more income. It's the way you flow it that makes a difference. So for the average person, I've just saved them tens of thousands of dollars in needless interest and 25 years or so off their mortgage. <laughs> wow. And you'll never hear about this from a bank. Never. Okay. Because banks, then they, they lose. The system right. works really, really well for them. Right, okay? right. They lose on the amortization. Right. So the existing bank thinks you're doing a great job by keeping your money in a checking account earning zero and paying them interest for 30 years with all the interest front end loaded. Right. The first 10 to 15 years, you're making very, very little progress on the principal. And then even better, if you refinance the loan, you start a new 30-year clock all over again. So the bank thinks you're doing a great job. (laughs) You're doing a great job for them. I'm trying to reverse the tables and actually have your money work for you instead of the bank. So I'm just going to do a very brief description. And as always, I like to give specific resources people can kind of find out more about these things. So instead of that traditional system we just talked about, you open a home equity line of credit, a HELOC, as they call it, which is a liquid line against your house take money in, you take money out, you can write checks on it, it's completely liquid, okay? You take money from the HELOC, pay down your first mortgage a little bit, then you keep your income in the HELOC, which pushes down your principal every day. HELOCs are based on what's called average daily balance. How much do I owe today, all right? And so the money that's going in there is pushing a balance down. You're, you're making progress in your principal, you pay off the HELOC, and then you do more towards your first, and then within five years or so, you can have it paid off. Let me just give you a very simple example, Mike, of how this might work, all right? Okay. So say you had a house worth 300000 and say you had a $200,000 first, at a good interest rate, 4%, whatever it may be. You then go out and get a HELOC, say for 50000 all right? You then write a check on the HELOC, 50000 towards the first. So now you owe fifty on the HELOC and one hundred and fifty on the first, right? Over the next year, you keep your money going into that HELOC and the 50000 goes down after a year or so, paid off. Do it again. Write another 50000 on the HELOC towards the first. Now you owe 100 in the first, 50 on the HELOC. Pay it down. Do it twice more. Your first is now paid off. In the fifth year, you pay off your HELOC. You are now mortgage-free. That's an oversimplified example of how it works. Wow. So every day, your progress is being made on that principal as opposed to almost no progress being made for many, many years on the same income you've already got. So your income essentially, let me try to get this right, is you're, let's say you're you're working a nine to five out there and you listen to this um, and you're an aspiring entrepreneur or an entrepreneur and you're just, you know, obviously in your own business and you take your income, you put it directly into the HELOC, that pays off that- um, that It pays it down. It it brings it down, but you're able to still, you're able to still cash flow your life. With Correct. That, now, with you that pay your box. checks, you pay your bills out of the HELOC. Correct. That's exactly right. But every day that money is in the HELOC, it's pushing your balance down a little bit. You have a $1,000 paycheck, and instead of keeping your checking account earning zero, you have it in the HELOC, pushing down your balance by $1,000. It's the That's same true. money. It's working for you. It's like the reverse of the compound of interest. You're taking it away. Correct. Exactly. Absolutely. You're... you're Correct. Instead of not, the way I like to put it is instead of not earning interest on the checking account, you're not paying interest on the HELOC. Right, right. And I think a lot of people forget that, that they're looking at interest rates and interest rates. But if you're able to bring down the entire balance, you're paying less interest and bringing your entire principal down. That just sounds like a no brainer. In a compounding way. In a compounding way. Correct. Yeah. Like it's almost every month that goes by, you're paying off more principal. And because you owe less principal, you owe less interest. 
So it compounds, and you're making more and more progress, as opposed to the traditional system when you're making no progress for a long, long, long time. So there's a free website called truthinequity.com, truthinequity.com, and you, it's a free site. You go on there, it explains this in more detail. It has what's called a personal profile, and you put on, it's completely secure, your income, your expenses, your mortgage, your house, your taxes, all different things. And it's going to say, okay, based on the numbers you just gave us, it's going to take you 28 and a half years to pay off your mortgage. And with the numbers you just gave us using the system, it'll be 5.6 years <laughs> to, the, to the day. They'll tell you exactly when you're going to pay your mortgage off because they've got the algorithm to figure it out. And your life doesn't change. Correct. Well, just the way your money is flowing. Right. But Correct. Your income is working for you. There are three things you need to make this work, Mike. The first thing, got to have equity in your house. Yep. If you're underwater in the house, there's nothing to borrow against. Right. Got to have a decent credit score, 680 or higher, to qualify for the HELOC. Third thing, positive cash flow. More money coming in than going out during the month. That positive cash flow is what's pushing that balance down. The more positive cash flow you have, the faster you pay off your mortgage. And I bet the vast majority of your listeners have that. Yep. And frankly, you can do this as a business as well. So for example, you, if you own, a, uh, own your office building or a factory or something, you can use the same technique to pay off your commercial real estate or say you have rental units. You could use the rent from the renters to have a HELOC and pay those rental units off and have them be free and clear 25 years faster than otherwise or something like that. So it has commercial applications as well as individual. I think it's awesome. That's a great value that I, I hope that all of our listeners will take a look and that, you know, at minimum, go to the website and see how this works. I think understanding that you're still going to have liquidity and writing a check if you need to, if the car Correct. breaks down, you still have this to go against. You're really just, again, utilizing the equity to bring down a principal and still being able to cash flow your, your monthly income. And frankly, uh, you can do awesome. this for other debts too. Now, Good. you can then pile in student loans, car loans, credit cards, all kinds of other debt you can pay off in exactly the same way. It's not only a mortgage. Mortgage is the biggest debt, but ultimately you pay off all your debt using this technique. HELOC, that's where it's at. Correct. So okay. anyway, that's, that's number one. I'd like to do things you might not have heard about before that kind of surprise. So let's do another one now Please. for businesses, okay? Because um, I find a lot of businesses, small business particularly, have a huge amount of debt but they don't know how to prioritize which creditor to pay first. So there's a strategy which is called debt prioritization, which allows you to pay the creditors with the most leverage over your business first. See, what most small businesses do is they're getting all these collecting letters and phone calls, and they pay the person that screams the loudest. <laughs> okay. That is not what you want to do. You want to pay the one that could shut your business down tomorrow. Yeah. So this is what, so there's a company called Corporate Turnaround, and they've got a website, helpwithpayables.com, and they've been doing this for 30 years. They have a very precise way of saying each creditor and what their, what's, what they call leverage ratio is, how much leverage they have over your business. Now, your utility company that could turn your lights off tomorrow has a lot of leverage. Some lawyer that you did a contract three years ago that you never went through with has no leverage. But the lawyer may scream louder than the utility company and you pay him first. Not a good idea. Yeah. So they prioritize your creditors to like three decimal points. And then they go out and to the creditor that's got a lot of leverage, they'll say, all right, we'll give you 70 cents on the dollar in a year. And to the guy that's got no leverage, they'll say, we'll give you 10 cents on the dollar in five years or whatever it may be. And then the creditors agree to the deal. You then make one payment to them. They disperse the money to the creditors. And you can get on to running your business instead of running from creditors all the time. If a creditor calls you say, I'm not doing it, call the corporate turnaround people. Done. Wow. Yeah. Talk about that. And plus, you don't have to deal with a headache. Correct. You can forget about all that stuff. You, you just have to make one payment a month. And your creditors have agreed to take a bit of a settlement. And you can get on with your life. I've seen this happen with many, many businesses. They've done, I don't know, 30,000 businesses. And they know exactly what amount of leverage each creditor has, which the average business person cannot possibly figure it out. So anyway, helpwithpayables.com is a website to help you out there. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. 
Hey, Jordan, out of all of your successes in business and the finance world, what's the one piece of pardon advice before we find out where, you know, your website and where everybody can find you, but what's the one piece of pardon advice that you'd give to aspiring and current entrepreneurs out there right now? The key word for success and entrepreneurship is leverage. And by leverage, I do not mean debt. I mean leveraging your relationships. One plus one equals three, okay? You and I can do things individually, but the two of us combined can do a lot more than each of us individually. And that's what you want to do when dealing with other people is see what the commonality is, what the leverage is, what skills you bring, what skills they bring. Because not only skills, sometimes it's money. It, 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 there's a lot of different things, but the two of you combined can do all kinds of things that is impossible alone. A lot of entrepreneurs, I find, think they want to do it all themselves. And uh, they can't trust anybody else to do it right. And that limits your growth potential. What makes it unlimited is operating leverage, I guess you might say. I mean, let's just take a dramatic example. Bill Gates is sitting there in his dorm room at Harvard, and he's got this idea for software, for this crazy thing called Microsoft, you know? Yeah. He starts doing it, and it's doing well. He brings on a few guys. When 30 years later, it's a multi, it's billion dollar company. He's got however many employees he's got working for him, right? Now, he didn't do all that, but he leveraged the talents of other people to serve customers. And now it's a huge enterprise and he's a multi, multi billionaire because he's profiting from the work that he started with all these other people working for him. That's the ultimate leverage, right? Yep. <laughs> That's a kind of dramatic example of it. But no, it's right. In your individual cases, just think it might be your vendor, could be your customer, could be your uh, funding partner. Everybody brings something to the party. And uh, I just find a lot of people don't appreciate the value of leverage and look for leverage. Look for other people who can do things. Understand what you do and understand what they do and figure out the two of you together how you can really make something happen. And that, that's the magic of small businesses employing leverage in the, in the best way. I think that's great advice. And Jordan, where can people find you? So my website's moneyanswers.com. I've actually created a special landing page just for your uh, listeners as well. Great. Which is go.moneyanswers.com slash life business. Life and business. Oh, sorry it. about that. Business and life. You got business it. and life. And at that, I've got a newsletter they can sign up for for free. I've got a link to this mortgage optimization things we talked about, some other resources. I've got all kinds of resources. I love to take emails. I'll get emails from your listeners as well. I always respond to them. Um, on my site, I've got videos, what I call the Money Answers Minute. I've got a newsletter. I've got uh, a, a podcast I do every uh, week um, called the Money Answers Show. There's just a lot of resources that people, I've just given you two out of hundreds of things yeah. can really make a difference in people's lives. Absolutely, guys. If you're listening, go to George's website, the holy value of what you just sent today. Thanks so much. I really appreciate your time and giving us and our listeners, even anybody that's just even a homeowner, we're going to share this to um, outside of all the people that are in the commercial world as well with their offices. But again, Jordan Goodman, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Rick. Really appreciate it. Life Nation, you've got to remember that in order for things to change, you must change. And in order for things to get better, you must get better. You just got better by hanging out with me, Michael Lebus, and the Business and Life Nation. So come back tomorrow because I'm here dropping sound bombs seven days a week, baby. If you'd like to subscribe, please do so you can take action and execute. See you tomorrow.